Welcome to another episode of What's Up Prof. Good day, Walter. Hi, Martin. Are you doing okay? Yes, I'm still coughing, but otherwise I'm fine. Well, we're just carrying on through the ailments. Otherwise, the work won't get done. That's right. We have no time for ailments. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is a subject that we have dealt with quite a few times. Many but times. But people keep writing and saying they don't see the connection between the Sabbath and the mark of the beast. Yeah, and, and the signs that are showing that we are nearing the mark of the beast is so clear. So it's just time to set it straight again. Yes, so... This time we've decided to actually put the quotes in because we always quote them off the top of our head and people want to see them black on white to make sure is this really the case or is this just conjecture. Yeah. Let's put it on the table and see exactly where we stand. So let's open with a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for giving us an opportunity to do this discussion again. We ask that you enlighten our minds and give us clarity of what you said in your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. What triggered it was an event that took place, or events that took mm. place, where prominent people <coughs> are referring to uh, Christianity and the secular world coming into conflict and it was, uh, it was so pertinent and so interesting, we'll be showing it in a moment, uh, that uh, we thought the mark of the beast needs to be discussed again, although we have discussed it many times. Yeah, the thing is, we are, like I mentioned before, we are really nearing this um, time in history. Yes. So the more you can be informed as to what it is and what to look for, the more you will be prepared for it or can prepare for it. Yes. Now, this opening slide that we have here has this arch quoting Exodus chapter 20, and it says, remember. Mm -hmm. There's one commandment that starts with remember, and that's the Sabbath commandment. And in the background, you have the Vatican. So that's a, a very significant uh, picture showing the actual conflict between ideologies. And I think we must, we must spend some time making it clear again what the conflict is all about and how deep does the rabbit hole go. Mm. A prayerful study of the Bible would show Protestants the real character of the papacy and would cause them to abhor and to shun it. But many are so wise in their own conceit that they feel no need of humbly seeking God that they may be led into the truth. Now, Martin, when she makes a statement like that, it must always be balanced with the idea that God loves people. True. And this is not against Catholics, no. it's against Catholicism. And it's not against the Protestant, it's against Protest fallen Protestantism. Correct. Although priding themselves on their enlightenment, they are ignorant both of the scriptures and the power of God. They must have some means of quieting their conscience, and they seek that which is least spiritual and humiliating. What they desire is a method of forgetting God which shall pass as a method of remembering him. Yeah. The papacy is well adapted to meet the wants of all these. It is prepared for two classes of mankind, embracing nearly the whole world, those who would be saved by their merits and those who would be saved in their sins. Here is the secret of its power. Now, if we look at our backdrop... There we have the mark of the beast, hand or forehead, question. There's two possibilities there, hand or, or. forehead. Mm -hmm. And the or is very important. Yes. And you have the Vatican over there, and you have the woman who is dressed in purple with all the crimson in the background. And this time there are 
two cups in her hand filled with wine. And we chose the one with the two cups because it's these two classes, those who would be saved by their merits. Mm -hmm. That's one false doctrine. And those who would be saved in their sins, that's another false doctrine. Here is the secret of her power. So it's a very symbolic backdrop. And uh, uh, it's AI generated, so I think it's rather impressive. And uh, I think we can say thank you to Henry for this yeah. one. <laughs> Revelation 13, 11, And I beheld another beast coming out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. I think we've, we've identified this beast at least a hundred times by now. And I'm sure people by the last three episodes will know now yes. who it is. And he exercises all the power of the first beast, Catholicism, before mm. him, and causes the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. So this power has influence mm. and he has capacity. He can cause the whole world to worship the first beast. In other words, to pay it homage yeah, to by being obedient to it. And what does he do? If we jump to verse 16, he causes all, it's a very big word, <laughs> Both small and great, doesn't matter if you're a professor at the university or whether you are of a humble uh, origin, rich, poor, free, bond to receive a mark in their right hand or in their forehead. The word or is very important. Yeah. They don't care whether it's in your hand or whether it's in your forehead, as long as you've got it. It's contrary to what God requires. Yes. He wants it and, yes. right hand and forehead. Yes. And there's a mark. And that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. Here is wisdom, let him that understands count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, not a computer system. Mm -hmm. It's a humanistic system, Martin. It's humanity raising its head against God, because otherwise God wouldn't warn against this, right? True. And his number is 603 score and 6. Well... We know who the second beast is. It is the United States of America. Mm -hmm. uh, that does on behalf of the first beast that which she requires. Yeah. And we've seen how the first beast controls the nations through its secret societies. So just to make that clear again, this system controls the world. Yes, the entire world. It doesn't matter whether we're talking about China or whether we're talking about New York. That's it. Even in Africa, it does not matter. Correct. Ezekiel 20, verse 12. <laughs> Moreover, also I gave them my Sabbaths to be a sign between me and them that they may know that I am the Lord that sanctify them. So there is a sign between God and man that he is the one that sanctifies humanity, and that sign is the Sabbath. Yeah. There right? it is. There it is. There's no way you can get around this. Let's go to verse 20. And hallow my Sabbaths, and there shall be a sign between me and you that you may know that I am the Lord your God. So, is it possible that somebody might perceive someone else as their Lord, their God? Yes. Is it possible that someone might perceive that sanctification can come by another route than by the Lord to God? They usually try all sorts of ways, like Cain did. Okay. So here's, here's a point of conflict. Mm. Is the Sabbath wedged in there as a pivotal point of determination? Exactly. So if you are in doubt on how to have that sign be very clear between you and God, here is the, it's the Sabbath. There's no two ways about it. The Sabbath is linked to the sanctifying power of God. And he's the only one who can do it. Yeah. No one else. 
So obviously there's an enemy that tries to do this a different way. And they can't have the Sabbath as a sign. They must have something else as a sign. That's it. So let's look at Exodus 31, 17. It is a sign. The word is oath. Between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made the heavens, the earth, and on the seventh day he rested and he was refreshed. Nafash. He took a sigh of relief. He mm -hmm. breathed. And that's the same he wants when you come and tabernacle with him on the Sabbath. It's a joy. <laughs> so let's have a look what Strong's tells us. What is the sign? This is this Hebrew word oath. It's a sign. It's a token. It's an ensign. It's a miracle. It's a mark. It's a signal. It's a mark. It's a banner. It's something that you hold out to people. And if you are against it, you'll be irritated by it. Mm. Try, uh, try getting a job appointment and bringing in the Sabbath. Is it going to go easy or will it be quite a tough call? At this stage of the Earth's history, it's a nightmare. It's a nightmare. All right. It's a remembrance. Mm. Remember. It's a miraculous sign. It's an omen. It's also a warning, Martin. Mm. It's a token, an ensign, a standard, a miracle, a proof. <laughs> so the only way to know which God you are serving really is through this sign. Yes, and it's easy actually. Now, which God are you serving, Martin? Well, the one of the Sabbath. The one of the Sabbath. The true Sabbath, yeah. Okay, so if you keep the seventh day, you are acknowledging a particular God, a yes. particular deity. Yeah. If you are keeping another day, you are acknowledging some other deity. Is that logical? That's logical. That's what the text says. So why is it a sign? Because in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth. And any sign or any mark or any ensign has these criteria. The name, the Lord, Yahweh. Mm -hmm. What is his title? He's the creator. What is his jurisdiction? It's heaven and earth. So it is the seal of God. It must have his name, his title, and his territory. And only the Sabbath commandment has that. And it spells it out in the commandment. Correct. So you can't really go wrong. No. Now, if it is a seal, if it is a sign, if it is a mark, then it is a symbol of authority. And any document of great importance in the world must have a seal on it, mm -hmm. a seal of authority. And it must be signed yeah. by someone in authority. I, whatever the name of the person or the entity is, uh, the president and then the jurisdiction, whatever the country is where your jurisdiction counts, those are the criteria that have to be in such a seal. Now, this Sabbath, Martin, people say that is a, it was a Jewish institution. Mm -hmm. Now, how can it be a Jewish institution if it was instituted in Eden when there was no Jew? Correct. And then if you go to the portion <clears throat> that says the Sabbath was made for man, that it does not make it exclusive for only the Jews. No. And in any case, the Jews, the word actually is a Judean. Yes. And they are descendants of Judah. Yes. So this really is something that applies to the whole world because it was introduced in Eden. Yes. But let's just make absolutely sure. Isaiah chapter 56 verse 6 says, Also the sons of the stranger that join themselves to the Lord to serve him and to love the name of the Lord, to be his servants, everyone that keeps the Sabbath from polluting it and takes hold of my covenant, even them will I bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices shall be accepted upon mine altar, for mine house shall be called a house of prayer for all people. Is the Sabbath only for the Jews, Martin? No, it's for the, all mankind. It's for all mankind. It's the distinguishing factor between serving God and serving something else. That's it. Deuteronomy eleven thirteen to 20, And it shall come to pass, if you shall hearken diligently unto my commandments, 
which I command you this day to take heed of to yourselves that your heart be not deceived, and you turn aside and serve other gods and worship them. Therefore shall you lay up these my words in your heart, in your soul, and bind them for a sign, there's that word mm. again, upon your hand that they may be as frontlets between your eyes. Now the Jews took this pretty literally, wrote them out and made a little plaque, tied it to their hands and to their forehead. Do you think that's what God had in mind? No. It must be internalized. In other words, you must have it as a sign on your hand. You mm. must act accordingly. Mm -hmm. And frontlets between your eyes, you must think accordingly. Cognitive. Yes. Not all. And. Mm. Right? It must be be in both places. You must think accordingly and act accordingly. The beast is satisfied with all. Yeah. As long as you obey him. And ye shall teach them your children, speak of them when thou sittest in thine house and when thou walkest by the way, when thou liest down and when thou risest up, and thou shalt write them upon the doorposts of thine house and upon thy gates. In other words, your whole life must be in harmony with them. Yeah. What enters into your gates, what happens in your house, must be in harmony with this system. That's the way God wants it. Mm -hmm. Let's make sure. Exodus chapter 13 verse 9. And it shall be a sign unto thee upon thine hand, and for a memorial between thine eyes, mm. that the Lord's law may be in thy mouth, for with a strong hand has the Lord brought thee out of Egypt. All right, so mark this mark of God, because Strong's defines it also as a mark, must be upon the hand, and it must be in your cognitive brain area, in your frontal lobe. It must be... Uh, on the moral issue that drives your life. Yes. Your decisions, every single one you make, must be filtered through this. Yes. And it must be in harmony with the Lord's law. Yeah. That's so, the law that must be stuck here and you filter everything. All right. So is it, a, is it a computer mark that he wants or does he want the law of God to be inscribed and particularly, as we have seen, the Sabbath as the pivotal commandment giving him the authority yes. to command it in the first place. Yes, otherwise we would have, once we were born, probably get a stamp on the forehead that's tattooed there forever. And the job would be done. Yeah. Yes, and you'd be a robot. Mm. Well, in 1956, Martin, this is what was advertised in New York. You see the three crosses, and it says, come to church on Sunday. Do you think society has changed since 1956? I think it has uh, changed quite a bit. <laughs> mm -hmm. now, I've been alive longer than 1956. So, uh, in fact, I was seven years old in 1956. So, Martin, somewhere along the line, things have changed. Well, this might have been portrayed as hate speech <laughs> today. <laughs> yeah, this would be against the Constitution. That was 1956. And today, this photo comes from 2023, but uh, this is what it looked like in 2024 as well, where they celebrate something other than Easter on that particular day. And this is a point of conflict. This is basically King of the North, King of the South confrontation that is taking place here. In direct opposite and very public. Very, very public. In your face. Mm. It's almost like a challenge. It is. Now, this is what happened very recently over the Easter period. Trump vows to create Christian Visibility Day following Biden's declaration of Trans Visibility Day. These are two different ideologies. <laughs> are they clashing? Oh, oh, completely in opposition and definitely clashing. Right. This was published on April the 2nd, 2024. 
Former President Trump vowed to create a Christian Visibility Day following President Biden's declaration of Transgender Day of Visibility, which happened to land on Easter Sunday this year. Now, this Easter thing is very interesting, mm -hmm. because uh, it is not to be confused with the Pash, mm -hmm. with the Passover. Okay, so that's very <clears throat> important Let's to explain. Let's just get this straight. Mm. The Passover was a ceremonial feast, mm. and its day was determined by the moon. Yeah. Not to be confused with the weekly cycle of keeping the Sabbath on the seventh day. Not to be confused at all. But the papacy declared that Easter would always have to be on a Sunday. Mm. And in actual fact, it's the feast of Ishtar. Mm. And it always takes place on a Sunday, which is not the case with the Passover. It could take place on any day. If the Passover should happen to coincide with a Sabbath day, for example, then it was a high Sabbath. Yeah. So just to make it plain, so when they worked out with the moon cycle and that year it fell on the Saturday, according to our reckoning now, it was a Sabbath, but it was a high Sabbath because this was the Correct. Sab uh, Passover Sabbath. Now the Pope well. changed it so that it would be a Sunday. And then it was an easy step to go from Easter Sunday to a weekly Sunday mm. rest. And that became the origin of Sunday worship. And this is what he said. And what the H <laughs> was Biden thinking when he declared Easter Sunday to be Trans Visibility Day? Trump asked his supporters during campaign rally in Green Bay, Wisconsin, on Tuesday, such total disrespect to Christians. The presumptive Republican nominee for president promised that November 5 would be a Christian visibility day if he is elected. Now, November 5 is also very interesting because it also happened to be Guy Fawkes Day. Mm -hmm. Now, I took this picture of this article where it says, Jesus, my savior, Trump is my president. Let's say it's interesting. Do we have a clash of concepts? Oh, yeah. Do we have a very prominent portrayal of King of the North philosophy against King of the South philosophy? It is crystal clear. Here are two mindsets mm. which are going to clash. And here is a promise. Christianity will take its place again. Yeah. Martin, does it go further than that? Is the Bible involved? No, yes. It's, it's, <laughs> and uh, Trump is really stepping up the, the, pressure, the right? pressure. All right, let's have a look at what he says over here. This Bible is the King James Version and also includes our founding father documents. Yes, the Constitution, which I'm fighting for every single day, very hard to keep Americans protected. Also, the Bill of Rights, the Declaration of Independence, and the Pledge of Allegiance are all part of this. God bless the USA Bible. And it's very important and very important to me. To make America great again is our religion. Religion is so important. It's so missing, but it's going to come back, and it's going to come back strong, just like our country is going to come back strong. And we answer to God in heaven. Christians are under siege. We must protect content that is pro-God, we love God, and we have to protect anything that is pro-God. We have to bring Christianity back into our lives and back into what will be again a great nation. We must make America pray again. So Martin, he's brought out a Bible which he wants to promote together with country music. Yeah, it's with the person that wrote the song, God Bless the USA. Right. Now, it's also interesting that the Bible says that when these things happen, in the book of Daniel it says so, it will be in connection with all kinds of music. For sure. <laughs> <laughs> and then when you have this very interesting other side of the story, and a famous atheist 
says he identifies as a cultural Christian and is horrified by promotion of Islamic holiday. And this also came out in April 2024. The famous atheist and evolutionary biologist Richard Dawkins explained he identified as a cultural Christian in an interview after learning Ramadan lights were hung on a street in the UK as opposed to hanging lights to celebrate Easter. Dawkins was referring to the mayor of London, Sadiq Khan, turning on 30,000 lights for Ramadan, the Muslim holy month, on the cusp of Easter weekend on Oxford Street. I must say I'm slightly horrified to hear that the Ramadan is being promoted instead, Dawkins said in an interview with Rachel S. Johnson Sunday. I feel that we are a Christian country. Now, Martin, does that make much sense to you? <laughs> if you understand the backdrop, yes, it does. But if you just, this is cognitive dissonance, if you have to look at it just. This is cognitive this. dissonance. So there on the one hand, you have the, the ideology that Christianity must come back. God must come back, prayer must come back, the Bible must come back. And here you have an atheist who says, we're a Christian country. Mm. And he doesn't want Muslim ideology associated with it. Now, Martin, this is fascinating. Let's just go into this a little deeper. So let's just see what his sentiment toward God really is and towards Christianity and Jesus Christ. We've quoted this before, but it's useful to quote it again in this setting. He writes in the, the book, The God Delusion, the God of the Old Testament is arguably the most unpleasant character in the whole of fiction. Jealous and proud of it, a petty, unjust, unforgiving control freak, a vindictive, bloodthirsty, ethnic cleanser, a misogynistic, homophobic, racist, infanticidal, genocidal, filicidal, pestilential, megalomaniacal, sodomisocistic, capriciously malevolent bully. <laughs> I think he looked up every adjective in the dictionary. It is unfair to attack such an easy target. The God hypothesis should not stand or fall with its most unlovely instantiation, Yahweh, nor his insipidly opposite Christian face, gentle Jesus, meek and mild. Martin, he trashes the whole system, mm -hmm. plus Christianity. Actually. But he's a cultural Christian, yeah. so he says. So how does this work? Let's just hear what he has to say on the issue. Well, I must say I was slightly horrified to hear that Ramadan is being promoted instead. I do think that we we are culturally a Christian country. I'm, I call myself a cultural Christian. I'm, I'm not a believer. But there's a distinction between being a believing Christian and being a cultural Christian. And so, you know, I, I love hymns and Christmas carols. And um, I I sort of feel at home in the Christian ethos. I feel that we are a Christian country in that sense. Uh, it's true that statistically the number of people who actually believe in Christianity is going down. Uh, and I, I'm happy with that. But I would not be happy if... Um, for example, we lost all our cathedrals and our beautiful parish churches. Um, so I, I count myself a cultural Christian. I think it would matter if we, certainly if we substituted any alternative religion, that would be tr truly dreadful. That I like to live in a culturally Christian country, although I do not believe a single word of the Christian faith. Well, insofar as fundamentalist Christians oppose evolution and think that the world is was created 6,000 years ago. I mean, that, that is pernicious nonsense, of course. I, I don't want to be misunderstood. I mean, I, I do think it's nonsense. But, uh, but um, the, the, the Christian belief, for the, I mean, today is Easter, and, and of course I don't believe that Jesus rose from the dead, and I don't believe you do either. So he's a cultural Christian. Yes. That's... So he's quite happy to live under Christian norms. Mm -hmm. He's quite happy about Easter. Even the carols and everything. Yes, he loves the hymns. Ames. And is dedicated to the culture. So he wouldn't mind a holiday on Easter, would he? No. 
Who do you think mind a holiday celebrating a sort of mini Easter every single Sunday? Especially when it's for the evolutionary, uh, evolutionary Earth. Yes, it would be marvelous. Mm. So Martin, let's just consider this a little bit. Let's take the first scenario. Trump says God has to come back, prayer has to come back, the Bible has to mm. come back. That is, in other words, a belief system where you believe in God, right? Yes, that is using your cognitive to say, I believe this. And therefore, I want these feasts and these festivals to be there. That is receiving something in your forehead. Yes. This man was quite happy to say, I'm a cultural Christian. I don't care two hoots about what they believe. It's a lot of nonsense. But I'm happy to go along with it. Where would he receive the mark? On, on, the, the, hand. on the hand. Are they both drinking from those two cups? Oh, for sure. And this is the probably the best example of those two that will go through that I've ever seen. Yes. And remember the theater for the final events will be in the Christian world. Yeah. All right. So now let's make it quite plain and clear to the people why it is a point of contention. Why is it important? Because what does it entail? Because especially this Easter time, a lot of people are confused, especially Christian, believing Christians, because, but Jesus rose on the Sunday. So that, what's wrong with celebrating the Sunday then? Yes. All right, Martin. So we need to put it quite plainly that it is a point of contention. For sure. And that the world should really know about it. And that the churches actually do know about it. Yes. But have decided to do nothing about it. About it. Okay. So let's get right into it. Why does the Christian world keep Sunday? Let's ask Webster's International Dictionary, the 19th edition. Sunday. So called because this day was anciently dedicated to the sun or its worship. That's pretty plain. Sunday. Dies Dollis of the Roman calendar, day of the sun, being dedicated to the sun the first day of the week. That's Schaef Herzer Encyclopedia regarding Sunday. Sabbath. A Hebrew word signifying rest. Sunday was a name given by the heathens to the first day of the week because it was the day on which they worshipped the sun. Here's a Bible cyclopedia, page 561. So there's no doubt about it that Sunday is the first day of the week and it was dedicated to sun worship. Yeah, it's pretty, <laughs> pretty and straightforward. Who, yeah, who gave the Sunday to the, the name? The heathens for, for their first day of the week. Daniel 7, verse 25. And he, speaking about the little horn power, that rises up amongst the ten horns, mm -hmm. in other words, that rises up amongst the powers of Europe, mm. before three of which had to be removed, the Ruli, the Ostrogoths, and the Vandals. Didn't they keep Sabbath, those three that were uprooted? There's pretty good evidence, historically, that they kept the Sabbath, so they had to be removed. And this power, this little horn power, which all reformers identified as the papal system, will speak great words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High. So he will fight against God's people. And he will think to change times and laws. And they shall be given into his hand until the time, times and the dividing of time. That's the 1260 year period of papal Supremacy from 538 to 1798, yeah. when the papal political power was removed by Napoleon. Yeah, that de uh, seemingly deadly wound that it received. But the Bible is absolutely clear that this power will think to change times and laws. He will attack God's law. Yeah. And particularly those dealing with time. Especially, so this is more aimed at God's laws than human laws. Yes. So let's see where this is leading. All right, let's take a look at a quote from the Roman Decretalia. This is their own writing. He, the Pope, can pronounce sentences and judgments in contradiction to the rights of nations, to the law of God and man. Would you say that's arrogant? Completely. It's 
playing God. Above, above God, actually. He can free himself from the commands of the apostles, he being their superior, and from the rules of the Old Testament. Is that escalating his arrogance? <laughs> For sure. The Pope has power to change times, to abrogate laws. Isn't that using the exact language of Daniel? Yep. To dispense with all things, even the precepts of Christ. How arrogant can you be? It cannot be is, anymore. Is this in your face? This sounds exactly like Lucifer. Okay. 1 John 3 verse 4, Whoever committed sin transgresses also the law. For sin is the transgression of the law. That's the definition of sin That's in it. the Bible. Yeah. Now, if you're going to change the law, are you transgressing it? Yes. Absolutely, right? For sure. So is this a man of sin talking here? Yes. So let's just look how he did it. So on the one side here, we have the Catechism of the Catholic Church, Article 2052-257. And... On the left, you have the law as it appears in the, in the King James Bible. It's also important just to emphasize that the Catholic Church see the catechism as their standard yes. above the Bible. Absolutely. So the, the Bible in the King James Version, the first commandment says, I am the Lord thy God which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage, thou shalt have no other gods before me. If you go to the catechism, it says, I am the Lord your God, you shall have no strange gods before me. It looks similar, but there is something missing. Now, what is that? The words, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage, are missing. Now, why? Well, that makes it a specific God. Yes, it's a very specific one. Which one? The one that brought you out of Egypt. If you want a generic God, mm -hmm. an ecumenical God, then you will have to remove that. Yeah. So that's exactly what they've done, because they're an ecumenical association. Mm -hmm. So they've taken it out. Now... The second commandment is a very long commandment in the Bible. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the waters under the earth. Do the heathen nations do that? Yes, they make idols of all sorts of things to worship. Right. So those that are under the earth, in other words, images of dead people, do they put them in their churches? Yes. Do the Catholics do that and call them saints? Yeah. All well, right. if you take uh, the other gods, Poseidon, all of these, this is also idol. Yes. And, and if you go to Rome, the statues that they have of Peter, they are actually heathen statues that they've just taken in yeah. and given them different names. Thou shalt not bow thyself down to them, nor serve them, for I, the Lord, Thy God, I am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. What he's basically saying, that if uh, you practice this in your home, it's likely to go to the third and fourth generation yeah. before there will be a change of heart, if ever there will be a change of heart. Now, Martin, would you say that this commandment would be a stone of stumbling to Catholicism? For sure, because they're full of idols. So what is the second commandment uh, in Catholicism? They've just taken it out. So if they've removed it, no. it's gone. It doesn't exist. So now they sit with a problem. They only have nine commandments. Mm -hmm. They have to correct that. But there's a very good reason why they have taken the second one out and why they've modified the first one yeah when it comes to the third commandment it says thou shalt not take the name of the lord thy god in vain for the lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain their catechism says you shall not take the name of the lord your god in vain so what has changed the admonition is gone mm. now there's a reason for that martin because if this commandment is of God, 
then he is the one that admonishes you and gives you a warning. Yes. If this commandment is from another source, then the previous source cannot admonish you. Mm. Therefore, let's take it out. Yeah. Because it's another deity taking the place of the first, because this is a changed law. That's it. So, and the punishment is gone. Yes, the punishment is gone, because it's another lawgiver here. Yeah. If you change the law, it's, an, it's another lawgiver. Now, the fourth commandment. It's also a very long commandment. Yeah. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shall you labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou nor thy son, thy daughter, thy manservant, thy maidservant, the cattle, etc. For in six days, here's the reason, the Lord made the heavens and the earth to see and all that in them is, and he rested on the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. It's so surprising to me that after reading the fourth commandment, you still can't see that Sabbath, the seventh day, was instituted in Eden. And it is the seal of God. That's it. it gives us jurisdiction. It, it spells it out clearly. It comes from Eden and that it's the sign. Yes, and it gives the name, Yahweh. <laughs> now their, th their commandment is now the third commandment because they've taken out the second one. And it now reads, remember to keep holy the Lord's day. Mm. Uh, they're very crafty. It could have read, remember to keep holy the first day. Yeah. Or this. They are implying that the Lord's day is the first day. Yes. But the Bible in Isaiah 58 tells us quite clearly that the Lord's holy day is the seventh day Sabbath. Yeah. So this is deception of the highest order. So what have they taken out, Martin? Well, they've taken out the entire heart of the document. Yeah. They've taken out the jurisdiction. They've replaced it. But they've changed something else as well, namely the Sabbath. Yeah. They've changed it to the Lord's Day, implying that the Lord's Day is a day other than the seventh day, which is a lie. And remember, the only place where they get that is in the book of Revelation, where John says he was in vision mm -hmm. on the Lord's Day. It doesn't define what day it is. No. Obviously, it was the Sabbath day, because that's the only day that is the Lord's day and the holy day. But they take it to be the first day of the week. You see, right through the New Testament as well, the Sabbath was kept a holy day. Yes. There was never a time Jesus kept it holy, the apostles kept it holy, everybody kept it holy. The only thing that they stand on is that the resurrection was on the first yes, day. Yes, but it doesn't say that that makes it the Lord's day. Exactly. Now, let's just make quite sure about this issue. Now, this is the New Baltimore Catechism and Mass. This comes from Father Maguire's New Baltimore Catechism and Mass of 1949. It bears, amongst others, the imprimatur of Francis Cardinal Spellman, Archbishop of New York. Maguire's version is, Remember thou keep holy the Lord's Day. To children and for whom this catechism is intended, this is explained by means of the following questions and answers. What is the third commandment of God? Already that's wrong, right? Yeah, let's be the fourth. The third commandment of God is, remember, thou keep holy the Lord's day. Why does the church command us to keep Sunday as the Lord's day? The church commands us to keep Sunday as the Lord's day, because on Sunday Christ rose from the dead, and on Sunday the Holy Ghost descended upon the apostles. Now, who commands it over here? The church. The, the Catholic. church commands it. Who commanded the fourth commandment? God did. God did. What are we commanded by the third commandment? Mm. By the third commandment, we are commanded to worship God in a special manner on Sunday, the Lord's Day. Mm. Not they, they don't the, even mention it as Sabbath, because like you mentioned, then it would be, they it, can't. All right, so is the remember gone? Yeah. No, it's changed into command. You must worship God in a special manner on Sunday. 
The other one said, remember the Sabbath day that the Lord created you, yeah. right? In other words, go back to your creator. This is a new commandment in its entirety. So let's ask them, how does the church command us to worship God on Sunday? Mm. The church commands us to worship God on Sunday by assisting at the holy sacrifice of the Mass. Mm. Now, Martin, this is a totally new commandment. It's another lawgiver. For sure. This commandment is not in the Ten Commandments of God. Mm. And to take part in the Mass, this is their famous Eucharist that they want everybody to partake in, which is a perpetual, mm. a perpetual sacrifice. When the Bible clearly says he was sacrificed once. Yeah, so this all. means he's being sacrificed every single Sunday. So this Baltimore Catechism is an abomination mm. because yeah. it is contrary to the law of God. So let's jump to the fifth commandment. Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Now, it's their fourth commandment, because they're one behind. Honor your father and your mother. So what's missing again? That portion. That your days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Mm. Now, it's interesting that Paul refers to this commandment as a commandment with a promise. Yeah. They've taken the promise yeah, out. Exactly, because who will fulfill the promise? Yes, it can't be God because there's a new lawgiver, yeah. so it has to be removed. That's the reason why they mm -hmm. removed it. Sixth commandment, thou shalt not kill. That stays more or less the same. Seventh commandment, thou shalt not commit adultery. Sixth commandment, thou shalt not commit adultery. But we must remember, Martin, that in the law of Moses, there is a long definition as to what this adultery attains to or what it means. Mm. And if we take Catholicism, that has been totally changed, yeah. particularly by Pope Francis. Yeah, yeah. The eighth commandment, which is their seventh, thou shalt not steal. The ninth, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor is their eighth commandment. Now, they will look pretty stupid if they end up with nine commandments. So they take the tenth commandment and they split it into two. Yeah. The tenth commandment reads, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. They divide it into two. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, and you shall not covet your neighbor's goods. Now, it's interesting that Protestantism, the Lutherans, took the Ten Commandments over from the Catechism of the Catholic Church. No. They didn't take the Bible version. <laughs> and it's interesting that they actually switched it around, these two, because theirs reads, you shall not covet your neighbor's house and the rest over there, whereas the Catholic one says, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife. So they switched that round as well, which is very silly. Yeah. Uh, they at least kept the order that it is here in the, in the Bible, but they switched them around. So, Martin, what did they remove, and if, why? Mm. Let's have a look. They took away the house, right? Which in the Protestant version is still there mm. in their one commandment. And they took away your manservants, your laborers, mm -hmm. male and female, your implements, and your transport. That's what they took away. Why? Because they claim the right to ownership to everything, which includes your house, which includes your workers, and which includes your implements and your vehicles. That's why you have to pay licenses today. Uh, on all of this. Because they don't belong to you. You've got a tax number. You have a license number for your car. Exactly. You have, to, you have a registration paper and you have to pay land tax for your property. Now, the interesting thing is that fascism is, in a sense, doing exactly the same thing. 
You have the appearance of ownership, mm. but you don't actually have ownership. Rome pertinently says that she alone has the right to ownership of property, and etc. Isn't it amazing? That's directly opposite to God that says he owns the cattle on a thousand hills. Yes, they claim they own mm. everything. So Martin, this is a totally new set of mm. commandments by a new lawgiver. Did they change times and laws? Yes. Well, we cannot deny it, right? Now let's go to the French Revolution where it becomes pretty blatant. Remember that uh, the end time world philosophy comes out of the bottomless pit in yes. Revelation chapter mm -hmm. 11. We discussed that in quite some detail. And the philosophers that were associated were people like Voltaire. Mm. Now, people don't know that these were Jesuits. No, they don't Voltaire know. Voltaire was a Jesuit. He was Jesuit trained. Mm. And they came up with a different set of commandments, which they depicted like this, <laughs> with a bundle of rods, which are the fasci. It's a fascist system. This is human rights. Mm. And above it, they had some interesting things. And then, of course, the symbol of the Jesuits right there. And this came out of the French Revolution. Now, if we look at it in a little bit more detail, human rights are taking the place of the Ten Commandments of God. Yeah. It's quite plain. Now, what deity is involved over here? Mm. Well, you have the system, which is fascism which is the Jesuit preferred system of governance. And they have the serpent, the life-giving mm. serpent, the eternal serpent with a tail in his mouth, above everything, that's Satan worship. Mm -hmm. And they worship him through the symbol of this little Phrygian hat, which was the hat of the French Revolution. What does it stand for? Well, here's the god Mitra. Mm. The sun god, the Persian sun god. Remember that the beast has the beast has the feet of a bear, yeah. which is Medo Persian. This is Mitraism. And there's his little hat that the sun god wears. So this is sun worship. Yeah. So human rights in the place of God's law is sun worship. That's it. And you find that hat interesting in a lot of cartoon characters. Yes, of course. Smurfs have it, for Smurfs? example. Uh, Noddy, so it's, it's, quite a, a few. it's a very deep rabbit hole. Mm. Let's not go into that. So let's make quite sure that Rome knows what it's talking about. This is the convert's catechism to the Catholic Church from 1957, which is the Sabbath day. Saturday is the <laughs> Sabbath day. Why do we observe Sunday instead of Saturday? We observe Sunday instead of Saturday. Because the Catholic Church transferred the solemnity from Saturday to Sunday. Do they say they did it? They say they did it. And the excuse that they use is that it's the Lord's Day because he rose on that day. Right. But that is not why they change it. They change it because they say they have the authority to do it. All right. Do they admit basically then that the apostles never changed it? Correct. Okay. Do they say it is their mark of authority? Mm -hmm. Yes, Sunday is our mark of authority. The church is above the Bible and the transference of Sabbath observance is proof of that fact. It comes from their own writings. Do they call it their mark? Yes. Are they the beast? For sure. Therefore, is it the mark of the beast? That's, that's how it is. That's the way it is, <laughs> whether you like it or not. And it has to do with the law of God. Yeah. Where does it have to be in God's case? In your forehead and, and in your, your hand. Mm -hmm. You must think accordingly, act accordingly. Where does it have to be for them? Either or. Either or, as long as you obey them, right? And if people have further doubt that this is old news, just go back two episodes or three episodes and go and look at that article that the Catholic News Agency put out that said, Sunday or the Lord's Day. All right. There's another article from the Catholic world. She took the pagan Sunday and made it the Christian Sunday. And thus the pagan Sunday dedicated to Balder became the Christian Sunday sacred to Jesus. Cardinal Gibbon says, of course the Catholic Church claims that the change was her act and the act is a mark of her ecclesiastical power. Do they use the word mark? <laughs> over yeah. and over. 
The Bible says, remember that thou keep holy the Sabbath day. The Catholic Church says, no. Is that arrogance? <laughs> Changing times and laws. By my divine power, is mm. that even more arrogance? Yeah. I abolish the Sabbath day and command you to keep holy the first day of the week. And lo, the entire civilized world bows down in reverent obedience to the command of the Holy Catholic Church, Father N. Wright, American Sentinel, of June 1893. Martin, are they in your face here? They blatantly. Shouldn't every Protestant say, now, hang on a minute. Mm. I'm not going to go along with this because God commanded one thing and these arrogant individuals command something else. True. That's a, that exactly the stand you're supposed to take. Not, um, uh, no, but we want to go with it. I wonder how blatant they can become. Mm. Let's have a look as we go along. Pope Pius in 1566, commanded by Council of Trent, it pleased the Church of God that the religious celebration of the Sabbath day should be transferred to the Lord's Day, which they define as Sunday, Catechismus Romanus, 1867. And remember, they're infallible. They can't change it. They can't go back on that. No. Catholic mirror, the Christian Sabbath is therefore to this day the acknowledged offspring of the Catholic Church as spouse of the Holy Ghost without a word of remonstrance from the Protestant world. Are they challenging Protestantism? They're actually saying there, you want to complain, but... You didn't even challenge this uh, us on this. In fact, at the Council of Trent, the Archbishop of Reggio said exactly that. He said, you say the Bible is your standard. Why are you obeying us on the issue of Sabbath Sunday? The Protestants had a wonderful opportunity there. at the Council of Trent to say, you're right. We should follow the Bible and the Bible alone. But by following the standard of the Catholic Church, they were no longer a church. They were rebels. That's because it. they refused to give up the Sunday. Yeah, they actually there, right there, just became wayward daughters. Yes. Catholic Press, Sydney, August 25, 1900. Sunday is a Catholic institution. Its claims to observance can be defended only on Catholic principles. From the beginning to the end of Scripture, there's not a single passage which warrants the transfer of weekly public worship from the last day of the week to the first. Do they know it? Yep. Therefore, they are not just misled or mistaken, they are arrogant. That's it. They are the misleading entity. Will they rub it into the faces? Let's see what the Archdiocese of Baltimore had to say. If Protestants would follow the Bible, they should worship God on the Sabbath day. In keeping the Sunday, they are following the law of the Catholic Church. In your face! Mm. Protestantism in discarding the authority of the Roman Catholic Church has no good reason for its Sunday theory and ought logically to keep Saturday as the Sabbath. This comes from the American Catholic Quarterly Review of 1883. Do they know what they're doing? Oh, no, for sure. Okay. Now, how arrogant can you get? This is what they say. Not the creator of the universe in Genesis 2, 1, 2, 3. But the Catholic Church can claim the honor of having granted man a pause to his work every seven days. Is that arrogant? Yeah. That's actually ensconced in human rights. You yeah. have the right to a day of rest. That's it. And that's the one that will be implemented. And they will implement that mm. human right. It is your human right to have the day of rest and the Catholic Church will grant it to you. It will be Sunday. That's it. And that's why... Richard Dawkins can say, I'm a cultural Christian because it's based on the human, human, um, laws. human laws. Humanism. And now, reason and common sense demand the acceptance of one or the other of these alternatives. Either Protestantism and the keeping holy of Saturday or Catholicity and the keeping holy of Sunday. Compromise is impossible. Compromise is impossible, they say, Martin. So if you do compromise, on whose side are you standing? On their side. So Martin, if the Protestant world mm. is speaking against Seventh-day Adventism, who are they obeying? Rome. Rome. Are they then worshipping Rome more than they are worshipping God? For sure, because these, Bible, these words are clear in the Bible, and here you can see directly whose words... It is that you're obeying. Okay. So could we say to Protestants, wake up? Oh, for sure. I, I wanted to say that a while back already uh, in this discussion. Please, people, wake up. All right. 
The authority of the church could therefore not be bound to the authority of scriptures because the church had changed the Sabbath into Sunday, not by command of Christ, but by its own authority. Canon and Tradition, page 263. Is this pretty clear? So what is higher, tradition or mm. the Bible? No, tradition wins again. All right, Martin. Should we talk about the Bible and its authority again? Oh, for sure. We have to put it straight, what the Bible, what the... Who, is where's that, the authority? Is that another bone of contention? Oh, <laughs> I think so. It's a bone of contention across all spectrums. It has to be because, and we've done this. But we've done it, it. We have to do it again because the problem is people don't realize how serious it is that we need to have the pure word to know what God says. And to know who we worship. Yeah. How do we tell the world who we worship? By keeping the Sabbath. That's it. It's the sign. It's a sign. It's showing the world who's the authority in your life. And those two cups that this woman is, is carrying over here, <laughs> hey, those that will be saved in their sins and those that will be saved by their works, mm. those that receive the mark in the forehead and those that receive the mark in their hand. Isn't that interesting? It's precisely what's happening and where we are heading. All right, Catholic record tells us Sunday is founded not on scripture but on tradition and is distinctly a Catholic institution. Mm. So the Protestants claim it as their own, but it's they're making fools of themselves. Yeah. The New Testament makes no explicit mention that the apostles changed the day of worship, but we know it from tradition. The new revised Baltimore Catechism. Easter Sunday and Easter Friday. Who decides the dates? The Pope decides the date. So it's not the Protestant churches. No, he oh. decides it. <laughs> now, what does the Lord feel about all of these traditions that take the place of the, of the law of God? Matthew 15, verses 3, 6, and 9. But he answered and said to them, Why do you also transgress the commandments of God by your traditions? And you voided the commandment of God by your tradition." But in vain they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. What? In vain. In vain. Human the, rights, in vain. In vain. In vain. Who gave us our, our rights? God gave us our rights. So that document, that human nonsense, that they, uh, document that they put there, is definitely not from God. No, it sounds beautiful, but it's contrary to the law of God. Now, do the Protestants know this, mm -hmm. or are they willfully ignorant, or are they just plain ignorant? Well, I think they know. They know. Let's have a look. The Episcopal Church. Is there any command in the New Testament to change the day of weekly rest from Saturday to Sunday? None. This is the manual of the Christian doctrine. We have made a change from the seventh day to the first day, from Saturday to Sunday, on the authority of the one holy Catholic and apostolic Church of Christ. <laughs> Why we keep Sunday? Do they acknowledge that they are worshipping in vain? Yeah, they're acknowledging that they succumb to the authority of the Catholic Church. All right. What about the Lutherans? The observance of the Lord's day is founded not on any command of God, but on the authority of the church. This is in the Augsburg Confession. Do they know it? Yes, and they already, uh, again, give the authority to the church above the authority of God. Right. What about the Presbyterians? A change of the day to be observed from the last day of the week to the first. There is no record, no express command authorizing this change. This comes from... Their writings, the Christian Sabbath. What about the Methodists? Take the matter of Sunday. There is no passage telling Christians to keep that day or to transfer the Jewish Sabbath to that day. This comes from their Christian advocate of 1942. Do mm. they know? Oh, for sure. But they've forgotten, right? The only problem is it wasn't a Jewish Sabbath. It was a human Sabbath. All right. But they've forgotten. Yeah. Is that why the commandment begins with remember? Yes. What about the Congregationalists? It is quite clear that however rigidly or devoutly we spend Sunday, we are not keeping the Sabbath. There is not a single sentence in the New Testament to suggest that we incur any penalty by violating the supposed sanctity of Sunday. 
This is their own writings, their own words. What about the Anglicans? Many people think that Sunday is the Sabbath, but neither in the New Testament nor in the early church is there anything to suggest that we have any right to transfer the observance of the seventh day of the week to the first. The Sabbath was and is Saturday, not Sunday. Church and people, 1947, do they know? They know, and they very rightly emphasize that not in the early church is there anything to suggest this? Because a lot of people say, oh no, but just after the disciples were there, they changed. They actually already started with Paul. Correct. These people know. What about the Baptists? There was and is a commandment to keep only the Sabbath day. But that Sabbath day was not Sunday. There is no scriptural evidence of the change of the Sabbath institution from the seventh day to the first day of the week. This is their own writing, Martin. And then they'll acknowledge that it, we're keeping the Lord's Day because of either the Catholic Church changing it or we, because he rose upon it. That's the only thing they go with. All right. So let's just make sure again. Sunday is purely a creation of the Catholic Church. It comes from the American Catholic Quarterly. Sunday. It is the law of the Catholic Church alone. American Sentinel. The observance of Sunday by Protestants is a homage they pay in spite of themselves to the authority of the Catholic Church. It is absolutely documented that they have no leg to stand on. Yeah. And they are worshipping the beast. That's it. Because he is the one that made those laws. But the Protestant says, how can I receive the teaching of an apostate church? Now they're being sarcastic, mm. Martin. This is the Catholic Church being sarcastic. Yes, this is the Baltimore Catholic Mirror. How, we ask, have you managed to receive her teachings all your life in direct opposition to your recognized teacher, the Bible on the Sabbath question? Is that a challenge? Yeah, that's actually... <laughs> they're laughing in their face. Okay. In the, in the Protestant face. Those who follow the Bible as their guide, the Israelites and the Seventh-day Adventists, have the exclusive weight of evidence on their side. Whilst the biblical Protestant has not a word in self-defense for the substitution of Sunday for Saturday. Do they know something, these Catholics? Do they know that the Israelites and the Seventh-day Adventists are actually keeping God's law? Yes. And the rest is keeping a Catholic law? Exactly, and they're not... Um, hiding it. They're not hiding it. And once again, go and look at that article. I'll put the link to the article again on, in this description of this video. Then in the Catholic Mary, the Catholic Church acknowledges that the Adventists are the only body of Christians with the Bible as their teacher, who can find no worry, warrant in its pages for the change of day from the seventh to the first. Hence their appellation, Seventh-day Adventists. Mm. Just explain the name again, because a lot of people, they don't want to have anything to do with it, because the name sounds so strange. Sounds so strange. They keep the seventh day because God said keep the seventh day. And they believe in the second coming of Christ. That's why they are called Seventh-day Adventists. Does the Catholic Church know why they're called Seventh-day Adventists? Precisely, that's why they mention So Martin, if they know it so well, do we need to be in an ecumenical council to remind them? No. No, they we, know it. We don't have to be there. If you are not there with an evangelistic purpose, then don't then go. Then don't go. The Catholic Church changed the observance of the Sabbath to Sunday by right of the divine infallible authority given to her by her founder, Jesus Christ. That's another Christ, by the way. The Protestant claiming the Bible to be their only guide of faith has no warrant for observing Sunday in this matter. The Seventh-day Adventist is the only consistent Protestant. Question box, the Catholic Universe Bulletin. Martin, the Rome says there's only one consistent Protestant organization in the world, and that's the Seventh-day Adventist. And that's the only church that they acknowledge is keeping the same laws and standards as the disciples did. Okay, so Martin... Isn't it interesting that both the Protestant world and the Catholic world are arrayed against the Seventh-day Adventists for in sure. this issue? Yeah. I always ask a question for the youth. Were the 
disciples after Jesus ascended to heaven, Seventh day Adventists. Of course, they kept the Sabbath, they mm -hmm. kept the seventh day, and they preached the coming of Christ in the future. So, so they were Seventh day Adventists. So maybe everybody, when Jesus said, go and make disciples, must realize that go and make Seventh day Adventists. Okay. Now, here's a very interesting one from the St. Catherine's Catholic Church Sentinel. And we'll just highlight this little portion where they say, people who think that the scriptures should be the sole authority should logically become Seventh-day Adventists and keep Saturday holy. Martin, this is actually why I am a Seventh-day Adventist. Because logically, if I want to follow the scriptures, I don't have much of a choice. Why do you want to have all sorts of extra-biblical excuses not to keep what the Bible says? Correct. Now, here's an interesting challenge that Rome issued via its webpage, immaculateheart.com, in 2003. Most Christians assume that Sunday is the biblically approved day of worship. The Roman Catholic Church protests that it transferred Christian worship from the biblical Sabbath, Saturday to Sunday, and that to try to argue that the change was made in the Bible is both dishonest and a denial of Catholic authority. That's a bomber. Do Protestants try to justify themselves from the Bible that the new day of worship yeah. is Sunday? That's why I'm saying the whole time. They, the only thing that they stand on is that Jesus changed it when he rose on the first day. That's the only biblical thing that they try. Okay. But the Bible says that you commemorate that in the baptism. Exactly. Now, they're saying it's dishonest. And they're saying it's a denial of Catholic authority. Mm. If Protestantism wants to base its teachings only on the Bible, it should worship on Saturday. So, Martin, the conflict between the mark of the beast and the mark of God is going to take place between Seventh-day Adventists and the entire Christian world. That's it. And here's a note from the editor of that article. And it says, the challenge issued by Rome over 100 years ago remains. Because there was a particular situation in the United States where they wanted to bring in Sunday laws in 1888. Yes. And so now he's saying the challenge issued by Rome then, 100 years ago, remains. Either the Catholic Church is right or the Seventh-day Adventists are right. Mm. Because it was a Seventh-day Adventist, A.T. Jones, that yeah. argued in the legislature of the United States that it was not right to introduce a Sunday law. And they actually won. So here they're saying either the Catholic Church is right or the Seventh-day Adventists are right. There can be no other choice. That's it. Once again, only two choices. Only two choices, not three, not four. And if one chooses neither, then the whole doctrine of sola scriptura collapses, and with it the pillar upon which all of Protestantism stands. What one has left then is an invented religion, an invented God, an invented set of beliefs that suits man's purpose and not the Creator's. Like Satan and Luther before them, they throw them in the same category, Protestants have spoken the creed in action and in thought, if not in word. I will not serve whom? The Catholic Church. Yeah. Martin, there can be no other church. Either you're a Catholic and you're with the Catholics like the Protestants, or you have to be a Seventh-day Adventist. This is their words, not mine. And doesn't it qualify what the Bible also says? You will have the qualification for being the remnant church? Yes, you have to keep the commandments of God and, keep, and hold to the testimony of Jesus. That's it. So, and that is then the Seventh-day Adventist church and it stands opposite to the other one. Yes. So let's just look at this verse in Isaiah 66. For as the new heavens and the new earth which I will make shall remain before me, says the Lord, so shall your seed and your name remain, and it shall come to pass from one new moon to another, 
And from one Sabbath to another shall all flesh come to worship before me, says the Lord. Will the Sabbath remain in the world to come? Yes, in heaven. So there will be a monthly festival and there will be a weekly festival. Mm -hmm. So what happens in the monthly festival? I assume that the tree of life mm -hmm. bears its fruit once a month, month, because that's what the Bible mm -hmm. says. So there will be a tree of life festival once a month, and there will be a Sabbath once a week. And the tree of life is in the city, the new Jerusalem. Now, what if the Sabbath will continue throughout all eternity? Mm. Did the papacy then eventually succeed in getting rid of it? No. So who has to be gotten rid of? Unfortunately, that the one. papacy. And that'll take place in the plagues. Yeah. So Martin, that is the long and the short of it. The mark of the beast is exactly what we have always said that it is. It is enforced Sunday worship. Mm -hmm. And if you comply you are paying homage to the beast. Who will force you? The United States of America will be the first to introduce the legislation, followed by other nations, and the whole world will come to the choice. Mm. And those who are convinced by the Bible incorrectly will have the mark in their forehead. Yeah. And those like Richard Dawkins, who say I'm a cultural Christian, or those that are New Agers and say they are Earth people will be culturally obedient to the command of the Holy mm -hmm. Catholic Church. And they will receive the mark in their hand. Yeah. That's the choice. I prefer to have the mark of God, the sign of God, in my forehead and in my hand. Amen. I agree. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are fast approaching that decision. And it is a decision of authority. Who do, we, who do we acknowledge as the authority in our lives? Help us to make the right decision lest we lose eternal life. Is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.